Aya, Valorous, Idris. The clash of woods echo out of the hedges of the, gar of the garden, and Alistair takes a step back, overwhelmed by a flurry of blows, until a strike lands on his leg, forcing his face flat on the grass. He gazes up at Edlin's approach with a blunted sword in his hand as he leads forward, offering his brother a hand. Come on, little brother. You need to keep your eyes open. How do you expect, expect me to keep my eyes open when you're swinging that thing at me over and over? This is what a battle is about, Alistair. He takes Edlin's hand and climbs to his feet. Would we ever actually be in a battle? Maybe, maybe not. Either way, we need to learn how to fight. We're nobles. If we are caught well, alone somewhere, even if we're not using our swords, we need to learn how to fight. Now, swords up, Alistair. The little noble sighs and holds up his practice blade. Edlin charges in again and strikes Alistair with one successive blow after another, and the clashes of their blades echo through the garden. The young noble backs away again, overwhelmed by the attack his eyes unable to stay focused on his brother or watch for any opportunity to counterattack. Unable to return a blow, Alistair moves his blade in response to Edlin's swing, keeping the blade from contacting his skin, but his defense is getting slow and sluggish from the fatigue, barely catching the attacks on time before Edlin moves on to the next one. Alistair, keep your eyes open! I, I can't! Keep it open, coward! Edlin, stop! Open them now! Stop! <laughs> As Edlin raises his blade for another strike, a fit of anger overtakes Alistair and he rushes in. The young noble can see nothing else but his red as his blade passes through something soft and wet. The thick liquid flows down Alistair's finger as his vision returns to normal. He sees Edlin looking into his eye with blood pouring out of his lips and dripping down his chin onto Alistair's knuckle. Edlin, he cries, cr <clears throat> backing away from the bloodied hilt of the sword and the blade, half of which is embedded inside his brother. I thought, was it not a practice sword? How? Edlin clasps onto his knee and gazes up at his younger brother. Why are you crying, Alistair? Because it was an accident. Edlin, someone help. Alistair runs over and kneels before his brother. Edlin, somebody help. I don't know what. I don't want to lose you too. Why are you lying, Alistair? What are you talking about? You tried so hard to convince yourself, but you hated me, did you not? No, I, I never. Those years of resentment. I had all of father's love. Never once did he ever gaze at you or mother, even when she was sick and dying, obsessed over his name and his fortune and nothing else. He got what he deserved, and so did I. No, I never... Alistair looks up, gazing at the frame of his bed again, but he feels neither a drop of sweat nor pain in his body. He returns his head slightly to look out the city beyond his window and lifts his body from the bed, walking out of his bedroom into the gardens below. He stands before the family crypt with a candle in his hand and takes one step onto the cold bricks, and then another until he reaches the door of the crypt. He pushes it open and walks further down along the wide and dark stairs, constructed with nothing but colorless and lifeless stones, lighting each torch until he passes, reaching the bottom of the wind winding steps and lands before one of the many aisles of the family crypt containing the hundreds of corpses of the Carlisle family generations past. His feet taken forward as if by its own memory, an instinct <clears throat> recalls where his family is kept. From the countless visits with Edlin, Alistair can navigate to the coffin with neither light nor senses, through the countless rows and columns. He stands before three with a carved plaque onto each of them labeled Rosario, Isabella, Larissa, Carlisle, Edlin, Remus, Carlisle, and Alden, Balin, Carlisle. He gently brushes his fingers over his mother's plaque, feeling each other and every letter carved into it and proceeds before his brothers. After a moment, Alistair pushes Edlin's coffin op <clears throat> open, revealing his brother's body lying still inside through clouds of dust and webs and a sheath sword wrapped around his fleshless fingers. The aroma of decay is so strong that it stings Alistair's eye in a dense fog, but the young noble pushes on and reaches for the hilt upon his brother's blade. Moving aside Edlin's fingers and wrapping a set of his own tightly around the handle, then around the sheath, he pulls from within. His brother's old sword raises it over the coffin, inspecting the still brand new looking shine of the blade as if it had never been used. In truth, it most likely had never been used. Edlin had the blade forged before leaving Idris, but it had never left its sheath as he died on the first ambush upon Fort Theron, thus starting this war. With his brother's sword in hand, Alistair closes the coffin and steps out of the crypt and back into his room. Leaving the sword onto the side of his bed, Alistair climbs in and closes his eyes, slowly back, falling back into slumber. 
Before the roosters even make their morning calls, the young, the young noble in a noble traveling outfit arrives at Idris's gate upon a white steed with a sword upon his waist, while Cheryl rides up beside him on a brown steed. Most of the caravan is making their final preparations with a company of 45 men, excluding the noble and his guard, consisting of 15 local mercenaries, leaving Father Decorous and 29 members of the church across a wide range of ages from young to middle age, but all have volunteered to assist. Along with them are 10 wagons full of supplies, drawn by two strong oxen. The road to Dallas tie from Idris is one of a that is relatively peaceful, as the area is more of an open field than stretches of woods and sitting between two major cities also deters bandits from attacking any travelers or merchants going along. Not to mention that there are many, not many travelers going to Idris from the capital, but plenty in reverse as exorcists often journey to the capital first to pick up any major transportation to other areas, and they can be just as deadly among, against mortal enemies as they are to demonic ones. Alistair rides up to meet Father Decorous with Cheryl and the priest upon a brown mare watches over the final preparations. When he sees the young noble, he graces him with a bow and greets him. Good morning to you, Lord Alistair. The old priest sees the exorcist and gives her acknowledgement. Cheryl silently returns in kind, and the priest turns his attention back to Alistair as he returns the greeting. Good morning to you as well, Father Decorous. How goes the preparation? Quite well. Everything from medical supplies to rations and blankets is all accounted for. We are checking for all the final details, ensuring that the oxen are fed, the wagons are of good quality, and we ensure ourselves that uh, we have our supplies for the trip. We should be ready to depart by the break of dawn. I see. Thank you for allowing me to join you. And thank you as well for your generous contribution, Father Decorous nods. As the sun breaks first light of the sky, the caravan makes its way down the road in this one singular column with Father Decorous in the lead and the noble and his bodyguards following shortly behind. Alistair looks back towards those tall ivory gates as they catch the first light and reflect it back upon him. He can feel its warmth bathing over him, and embracing him as sweet as a lover's gaze. Then he returns his eyes forward again, and takes his first step onto the road ahead. Twenty fifth through the twenty sixth of Red Sun, AC, year eighteen thirty three, Orisea, Valorous, Road to Dallas Tie. The caravan moves silently down the road with a nary a voice to be heard except for the song of the birds humming in the rhythm with the marching footsteps of the caravan. The day passes on very much uneventfully until the night when the camps were set and neither noble nor the priest set up any large or luxurious shelter, rather settling for smaller, humbler tents that are easier to carry and set up, supposedly. Alistair stands there staring at the simple green leather tent in his hand and attempt to put all his mental energy into figuring out how to set it up. He observes the priest as they do, but fails to replicate the process, and he can feel Cheryl's eyes upon him. But whether she feels pity as he struggles to perform a, men a menial task, or think nothing of it, the noble cannot tell. Only that her gaze is still and discomforting. As the fire starts and others finish setting up their tents, the noble alone remains struggling as he turns with a quiet sigh toward the exorcist. Cheryl, could you help me set up my tent? As you wish, my lord. She replies and kneels before the noble and begins setting it up as naturally as Alistair can walk and breathe. She unfolds it with ease and sets the anchor to the ground. Before a few minutes had even passed, she finishes with no interference from the noble. Thank you. <laughs> Alistair rubs the back of his head while avoiding Cheryl's eyes. That was very well done. It is expected for, of all exorcists for, to possess survival skills as we often travel and endure long journeys across wild lands, the exorcist replies factually. After a brief pause, the young noble gazes at Cheryl, who stands there frozen like a statue before the air grows progressively stiff for him. So, what is it like being an exorcist? It is well. Alistair shares, stares at Cheryl with uncertainty. Well, yes, but is it satisfying, or are you happy as an exorcist? Her face tilts, indicating her confusion toward the question, and the noble rephrases. Do you like what you do? I do what is required of me. My personal feelings are of no relevance to me. It should if you dislike what you are doing. Why continue? What else would I be doing, my lord? Anything, like baking or blacksmithing? An exorcist neither has the time nor proper equipment to bake, and we are taught so. Not as an exorcist, Cheryl. The noble finds himself at odds uh, with vexation growing in his attempts to talk to her yet. No talking to her makes him feel difficult. I mean, as a person. I have no other desire... I was raised by the order for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to complete my responsibility as it was given to me. How could someone have no desire? 
Such is the way of, uh, of the order. Des desire can breed sins of greed, lust, wrath, pride, gluttony, envy, and sloth. These sins can expose us to danger when we are confronted by demonic forces thus preventing us from carrying out our duties. Alistair looks away. Not entirely sure what to make of this. He thought back to the old Grandmaster who is also an exorcist at his prime, yet he is nothing like the girl before him. So, if the Order commands you to slay the innocent, I shall comply. And if the Order commands you to slay your comrades, I shall comply. And if the Order commands you to slay yourself, I shall comply. And if a Grandmaster commands you to slay a fellow Grandmaster, then Cheryl looks away, thinking carefully about her answer with the same cold and emotionless face that gives Alistair a distressing feeling. If the heads of the Order turn on one another, whose command do you heed? Alistair repeats his question. My apologies. I have no proper answer for you. Your singular purpose seems to be rather weak if that is the case. Perhaps, but such an event is a rare occurrence, and if such an event should occur, then I suppose I will decide. I am not without my own mind, and if I may say so, I think I am more fulfilled than most in this world, because I have a clear and defined purpose. I suppose you might be right, Alistair looks away, and the exorcist glares at the noble with a hint of curiosity in her eyes. Lord Alistair, if I may ask, what is your purpose, then, since you inquire me of mine? My purpose? I suppose it is to help others. A broad purpose and an admirable one, but ultimately foolish. Alistair turns his whole body towards her and gives Al Cheryl a troubled look. How could helping others be foolish? If you define your purpose by the virtue of helping others, then it equates to declaring your existence below others. If that is the case, then you should not be living on the streets willingly. Give up, you should willingly give up all your fortunes for others. Even now, there are those who dwell in the slums of Idris, are there not? True, but there will always be poverty. Yes, and as you have just proven... Neither one of our purposes is particularly strong, but if we were to determine which is more realistic and genuine, I must confess I believe mine to be more than so than yours, my lord. How so? Your purpose is determined by the orders of the Grand Masters who command that you, he that you heed with little independent thought. Yes, but if the Grand Masters command me to slay a demon who haunts a village, am I not helping the villagers by slaying the demon? If I am to protect a man who is being hunted by a cultist, am I not helping the man and his family? Helping others is not my goal but I still accomplish it nevertheless. I consider helping others not as a purpose, but the result of a purpose. Alistair gazes into the fire and nods a bit in agreement. I think I understand. He looks at the exorcist again, and before he realizes it, his discomfort with Cheryl seems to have subsided somewhat, and he actually feels a, a sense of affiliation to her, but her eyes still feel really cold. <laughs> Thank you for the conversation, Cheryl. I feel rather wary, so I will retire for the night. Very well. Have a good night's rest, Lord Alistair. The young noble pushes the opening of his tent aside, then stares at his cot. With a sigh, he undoes his boots and his gloves and then even pieces of his clothing before he climbs on and retires for the night. The hours passed on and the fire had been put out. The crickets sing their song as the moonlight illuminates the inside of his tent, but he finds himself unable to close his eyes for any more than a few seconds at a time. He shuffles about, aching with bits of pain and discomfort until the frustration boils to where he steps out of his tent overlooking the quiet camp as everyone sleeps soundly in their beds. Alistair gazes about and sees Cheryl upon a tree, quiet and eyes closed, with her katana wrapped tightly around her arm. He gives the exorcist a pensive look and walks away, wandering into the woods beyond. As he strolls about, he can hear the snickering of the darkness about him, laughing as he wanders aimlessly and without a purpose through these woods further and further away from the lights of the camp and into the darkness. His feet continue to take him outward, and he knows not why, but his anger keeps him moving. Keeps him from questioning anything as he does as he proceeds on with teeth clenched and fists tightened. Even the winds of the night will not greet him, nor the air will stir in his presence as he stomps through the wood, snapping the grass below his feet and crushing any wildflowers he comes upon it, until at last he gazes back and sees nothing. From behind, from the front and side to side, he is entirely enveloped by a field of darkness, and he knows neither where he was has wandered from or where he came from. And as the anger fades, fear seeps in, crawling across his body. The wind dies away, but he can still feel the chill rising on his body as his darkness seems to possess a mind of its own. Slowly approaching him with their sharp and numerous tendrils, Alistair turns his head around, aware of the hostile darkness, but with nowhere to flee. He can do nothing but gaze across the woods as it comes upon him. Cheryl! Father Decorous! Somebody! The dark wraps around Alistair's leg and slithers up his body as he cries to the empty void. 
What the hell is this? He reaches for the tendril, but his hand feels nothing, even though his legs remain frozen and tight inside the grip of this darkness, like the prey of a cobra. He feels the blood inside him, his limb draining and becoming numb, as additional tendrils creep upon his arms and legs, binding them with such a tightness that it squeezes out his soul. Cheryl, help! As he cries out, he could feel the tendril wrapping around his neck as well, ripping away the air inside him and crushing his voice. Unable to call out anymore, he frantically struggles against the darkness until he opens his eyes to Cheryl, who is sitting beside him inside his tent. He looks up, feeling drenched in heat and sweat as his fingers clutch at the exorcist's uniform with a wet trail on his face. What happened? You're having night terrors, Lord Alistair. You are crying for help in your sleep. Ugh. Alistair immediately releases his grip on the exorcist and backs away, feeling humiliated. What else did I say in my sleep? You called off for help, my lord. That was all. That is all? Yes, I came here thinking there was an intruder, but that does not seem to be the case. Did I wake anybody else? No, I do not think so. I woke as you began. Thank you. Are you sure you'll be fine, Lord Alistair? It seems the nightmare was quite acute. Yes, Cheryl, I am fine. Please, leave me. As you wish. She quietly exits the tent. Alistair gazes towards the darkness before him, still panting in exhaustion. His body aches all over as if the darkness had, that had gripped him was very much real and still crushing him even now as he struggles to shake his arm free of the numbness. The feeling gradually wears away and he regains the use of his limbs again, but with his body still damp, he casts his blanket aside and lies on his side, staring at Edlin's sword beside him, quietly just staring at the details of the blade until the night naturally lulls him back to slumber. Twenty six of the Red Sun AC, year eighteen thirty three, Orisea, Valorous, Road to Dallas Tie. Alistair wakes up at the sight of Cheryl again before the sun had even lifted, but he knew that he would be leaving early as he raises his head without a word after the exorcist wakes him. She silently leaves his tent with a bow and allows him to make his morning preparation. Once Alistair finishes, he leaves his tent, and as the exorcist prepares to take part, the young noble holds out his hand, stopping her. No. I can take it apart myself. She nods and backs away, allowing the noble to remove the stakes one by one and his tent deflates. He bounds the tent tightly and places it onto the side of his horse as the rest of the camp is being taken apart and the caravan is ready to move again, just as the sun begins to shine. The remainder of the day is relatively calm like the previous, where the occasional traveler or merchant will come by and say their greetings to the priest, and even a few asking for a blessing from the father. But the journey overall had been quiet, and the party rides for much of its day in sullen silence taking occasional breaks for meals or afternoon prayers, and then carrying on once again. As his horse gallops along, Alistair stares up into the sky, watching the birds circling overhead with wings spread. They cast, they cast a great shadow across the ground, stretching through the road, and shrouding him and his companion. And then, the, and then the young noble recalls another childhood memory where they spent their afternoon hunting birds with Edlin, successfully felling about four of his twenty arrows, but Alistair walks away that day with not a single shot. He turns back to Cheryl, who looks ever forward with her deserted eyes, and the young noble feel, feels a scent of admiration, but also resentment for the exorcist as she looks ahead with certainty at her path, and yet she sits on his white steed, looking back at her. He turns his head forward again and hides his feelings as best as he could as he urges his horse forward, distancing himself further from the exorcist and riding next to the head priest. Father Decorous, Alistair greets the elderly priest with a simple gesture. Lord Alistair. Have you ever been to the capital, Father? Of course. I was born there. Alistair looks at the priest pleasantly surprised. Really? Why did you move to Idris? Too much noise in the city. Idris is also pretty noisy. In certain areas, but Idris, I, but Idris has a quaintness to it. During the night, Idris is as quiet as a mouse, while even the churches have its nightly events in Dallas tie. Really? What was it like growing up in the capital? Uh, I suppose I have something of an odd perspective in that regard. I was born in the slums. The, the pleasant surprise turns to shock. You were a slum dweller? Yes, my lord. Indeed I was. I suppose I still am. I dwell the slums regularly, so would that make me a slum dweller still? Well, I... Alistair struggles to think of an answer without offending the priest, but the father smirks, enjoying the troubled expression. You're still too na naive and young, Lord Alistair. 
I can understand if Grandmaster Larian fears for you, but I confess I have my own personal reasons for taking you with me. How so? The noble asks. You are the most powerful lord in Idris, and your name has meaning beyond that city. Your father was a good man, but he is still of noble blood. Never had he really ever bent his back over for others, and I suspect the same could be said for you and your brother too. And yet here before me is a Carlisle who wishes to serve. Alistair looks away, feeling ashamed. You must not think too highly of my family, then. Not at all. Quite the opposite, in fact. I told you before. I have not but respect for your family, and I admire your father very much. He is a tenacious man, and I am certain he was as ruthless as he was determined in his youth. All qualities very much required by a noble growing up, and he fits that role perfectly. Edelin, too, is just like your father. But you, however, are closer to your mother. Naive, yes, as all boys are, but your heart is in the right place. We all have our role to play, and your father played his perfectly. Nothing else needs to be said but what your role is. Remains to be seen, and it is my hope that I can guide you towards it, whatever it may be. The young noble smiles gratefully at the old priest. Thank you, Father Decorous. I am certain that there is quite a bit I can learn from you. For one, I think you would know a great deal about my mother. Perhaps more than I even I could remember. But I was hoping to learn a bit more about the capital. Ah, well, I can only tell you about my life in Dallas Tie, but that is nothing of interest. I prefer to hear the aspiration of the young that will shape the future rather than me to spin old tales. But there is wisdom to old tales that the young can learn from. Do you not agree? Very true. I suppose I can grace you with a short tale. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. My life in the slums of the capital. I never knew who my father was, and I don't think my mother knew either. It is probably one of many men that my mother had served. She was a prostitute at one of the brothels, but despite what she was, she was a devout woman. She prays to the goddess and other divinities every morning and every night. Alistair unknowingly gives the father an odd look, and the priest stops to laugh at the noble's expression once again. Realizing that he has allowed his thoughts to betray him, Alistair quickly freezes his face into a rigid form, but the priest simply laughs. I can understand how that might seem strange, and I admit that my mother's ideals are rather odd. She was not a whore actively seeking men, but she took pleasure in bringing these men some kind of happiness that they otherwise lacked. Although at the cost of some financial expenses as she does need to eat and feed a child. As my mother once said, the goddess creates a woman's womb as a miracle that gives life. And if it could be used as a miracle to give men happiness, then why should it need sh she not use it as such? She seems, Alistair stumbles through his words, like an interesting woman. Oh yes, she was. Even though I was a slum boy, she actively encouraged me to have an education. Of course, she could not afford to send me off to school, so she would read to me daily from the holy books as she does her morning and nightly prayers and during the day. She would have me help the brothel keeper count coins or read the ledgers, but alas, humanity can be cruel, and when I grew to my teenage years, I started to attract the leers and jests from other boys of all statuses. It seems odd to me that they would shame me for being the son of a prostitute, but I did eventually get angry, and I protested my wife, my mother's ways of life, not because I dislike her or, prof or her profession, but I just wanted the other boys to stop making fun of me. But she was patient and kind. One day, when one of the boys threw stones at me, I attacked him viciously, but rather than scolding me, my mother gave her my holy tome and asked me to read. Gave me her holy tome and asked me to read, and so I did. After I finished a page, she gazes at me with a smile and asks, can those boys do what you just did? So I continued looking after the brothel, and when my mother got gold, and when my mother got old, the brothel keeper took care of her, and I took care of the brothel in return. When she died, I had nothing left in Dallas tie, and I did not wish to stay and become a brothel keeper. So I left with my mother's ashes and with whatever coins I could save. I visited Lucy at Santa Lucia, spread her ashes over the sea. Since I could read, I was taken to the Holy Church as a monk and spent more time there educating myself until I got homesick and came back to Valorous. But I found myself unable to live peacefully in the capital, so to Idris I made my new home. With a blissful sigh, Father Decorous gazes up at the sky above, and there you are, the simple tale of a simple man. Pardon me if I do not give you any pragmatic information on the capital. No, not at all. Alistair shakes his head adamantly. It is a wonderful story, Father Decorous. Thank you, Lord Alistair. You are too kind. Perhaps when we have time, I can tell you more about your mother and your father as well. They are good people, and it is the hope of every parent that their child is better than they were. Thank you, Father, for your wisdom. 
He smiles toward the priest, but at the back of his mind, something gnaws at Alistair. Something dark and sinister that constantly gnaws at his very being, even as he presents before the father a more genuine smile than he had ever given his real father. 26th to the 27th of Red Sun, A.C., year 1833, Orisea, Valorous, Rhoda Tai. Night comes to rest, and the caravan stops along the road again with the campfire roaring and the young noble sitting beside it for warmth. His tent is set, although rather crudely behind him, Alistair had observed carefully the night before as Cheryl sets the tent up and imitates to the best of his ability. Her every action receives some mild success, but realizing now that he had become prone to night terrors that forces him to cry out, he moves his tent away from the camp and closer to the woods, however inconvenient it may be. When most of the party have retired for the night, Alistair proceeds to his tent and lies still upon his cot, hearing the chirps and the crickets and the rustling of wind along the gentle breeze. He focuses his mind upon the peace and tranquility around him and closes his eyes, falling for hums of nature's gentle lullaby. He looks up at the clear dreamscape of his mind, gazing up at those vast empty skies with the occasional drifting white clouds of no discernible shape in the garden of the Carlisle state around him, with its walls of hedges stretching beyond a sea of eternity made up of grass, and before these hedges is Edlin staring back at Alistair with those eyes brimming with judgment. "'Will you not leave me alone?' the, jo the young noble asks." And yet the phantom of Edlin stands there silently. Leave me alone, please. Alistair approaches and rips his sword out of his sheath, plunging the blade deep into the phantom. His brother stumbles back and blood flows from his lips. Go away, you're not real. Alistair tears his blade out and plunges it back in, soaking his arm in blood. You're not my brother. He's dead. Frustration goes inside him as he rips the sword out and drives into Edlin again, his voice growing louder and pouring with anger. And he will remain just so like my father and my mother, all of them dead and deserve to be. The young noble peers into those empty eyes that threaten to swallow him into the void and rests his forehead against his brothers. Why will you not give me peace, Edlin? The phantom reaches down and takes the blade from him. He holds it towards the ground and presses the sword against Alistair's palm, forcing him to grip it with both hands. His finger wraps tightly around the handle, then raises the sword toward his own stomach. Edlin smiles, and Alistair stares long into the bloody blade in his hand before waking up, just as he hears Cheryl t entering his tent. I'm awake, Cheryl, the noble announces. Oh, and I will take my leave, Lord Alistair. The young noble lifts his head and gazes at the exorcist as she leaves. Was I calling out in my sleep? <clears throat> Cheryl turns her head slightly towards him and replies, No, my lord. Okay, thank you. The exorcist departs as he sits there, alone in the darkness of his tent. The caravan begins their trek again, and as the afternoon passes, Father Decorous announces to the rest of the group, I believe we are entering Dallas Thai territory now. It should be no more than one and a half days' journey until we reach the capital. The young noble remains saddled on his horse, hearing the words from the father, but feels none of the enthusiasm he had previously. His mind feels dull and heavy constantly replaying his dream until he runs his body ragged from the thoughts alone. For the rest of the day, Alistair remains as silent as a corpse, neither speaking a word nor making a sound, even as he ate. So odd it must have seemed as the exorcist took notice and approaches him. Lord Alistair, are you all right? The noble looks at the exorcist and gives her a quiet nod. She returns her attention to the road but remains close by, ever so vigilant. Even Alistair did not feel too bothered by Cheryl's presence as his mind wanders off again to his dreams and memories. Father Decorous looks to the sky and smiles at the sight of smoke rising in a neat little column. Settlements, he said, the priest announces. Alistair brings his attention back to the world before him as more columns of smoke emerge from the horizon. The caravan sighted the first home of the farming village with chimney abundance and wisps of smoke escaping along the smell of fresh stew and roasted venison. But the air of this town feels strange. The exorcist, too, senses this oddity and tightens her grip on the sheath of her weapon while her fingers instinctively reach for its handle. Alistair rides up beside Father Decorous and looks around at the empty roads and noiseless air that envelops this town and turns to the priest. The noble can tell. Father Decorous senses something amiss, too, as, he look, as a look of apprehension fills the father's face. Alistair gently nudges him. Father, are you okay? Yes, but where are the people? The caravan stops in the middle of the village and it escort, its escorts dismount. 
All of you stay with the caravan. Protect the goods if something happens, the father orders. He approaches one of the nearby homes, and the eyes of the caravan guards move about, inspecting every corner of the village from where they stand. The noble joins in, inspecting the village carefully while Cheryl has her hand firmly on the handle of her katana. Father Decorous opens one of the abode's doors and enters. Alistair and Cheryl break off from the caravan and follow the priest, looking into the empty home with a cauldron of stew, still actively boiling over the fire. Father Decorous kneels over the cauldron. How strange. They must have left in quite a hurry. A cry is heard from the outside, and the three rushes out to rejoin the caravan, only to find one of the guards dead upon with a pool of blood with a small crossbow bolt stuck out of his neck. We're under attack! The, the mercenary cries as they scramble to surround the wagons and the priests in the middle. Cheryl unsheaths her sharp and glimmering blade as Alistair does the same with his sword, although unlike the exorcist, his hand trembles as he stares at the pool of blood before him. The exorcist steps before Father Decorous and the young noble with her hands firmly upon the grip of her sword and her foot ready to intercept any attack. Father Decorous, Lord Alistair, please remain behind me, she instructed. A bolt flies out of a nearby bush aimed for the noble, but the exorcist plants her feet firmly into the soil and swings, her blade moving like a ray of light shining and flashes across the air, splitting the very air it touches, moving past the bolt and splitting it in half. The two pieces of the bolt fall between her feet, and with another quick movement of her hand, a dagger appears from her wrist and flies into the bush, following by an agonizing scream. A vizian in a tight and black leather armor scrambles out of the bush, aiming a crossbow on his leather bracer at the exorcist for one final and desperate attack, but she had already begun to dash at her target with lightning speed, driving her katana through the, the enemy's throat in, as the bolt releases into the sky. A vizian? How could they have gotten so deep into Valerian territories? Alistair stares at the dead vizian bleeding its red blood as Cheryl pulls her sword out with one precise stroke. More bolts fly out of the bushes as the exorcist is moved back to protect the father and the noble, and the guards raise their shields to deflect the attack. A Vizian leaps out, holding up a metallic-looking hilt. A spell seal appears, constructing a blade of mana from it, and it charges the group of defenders. One of the guards reacted thrusts a spear at the Vizian, but it leaps in an inhuman height with its hind legs, slicing the mana blade across the guard's torso. The blade phases through his armor, tearing into the flesh and the bone, and the blood drips out of the uncut armor as he collapses to the floor. Alistair grazes, gazes horrifically as the guard, at the guard as he falls to the ground and then to the blade of mana inside the Vizian's hand. The noble catches the enemy's sight and it charges him. Father Decorous, as its brethren appear with the same mana blade type weapon, aiming for the caravan defenders, Cheryl moves to intercept the Vizian and it smiles arrogantly as he lunged for the mana blade at the exorcist's head. But to his surprise, the mana blade dissipates upon contact with her sword. She splits the Vizian's arm from its body with one and quick and clean stroke and another simply removing the head. The blood splatters on the face of the exorcist and yet her eyes remain focused and clear on her target as she charges forward, dispatching one foe after another with clean and precise movement. Destroying one mana blade after another as she slices the Vizians into ribbons, her skills easily overwhelm the opponents. With her seemingly normal weapon in hand, but even with her ability to cut down two or three at a time, more are overwhelming the main defenders and with their devastating new weapons. Alistair steps forward and with fury drives his sword through an unsuspecting Vizian from behind, pointing toward the woods. Cheryl, clear a path. Everybody, we need to follow her. The exorcist abides by his command and cleaves a, a bloody path through the enemy as the priest scrambles to remain behind her and the defender catches up shortly, protecting the rear. A cry escapes from behind as the noble turns back and sees a Vizian pulling the father away from the rest of the group with its fingers over the priest's mouth. Father Decorous bites the Vizian, forcing him to release his grip and cries out again. Father Decorous, Alistair yells to the priest as the father gets dragged away. The, young, the noble grits his teeth and gazes at the fleeing party as they escape the village and back to Father Decorous. Cheryl halts and rushes the others to the woods before turning back. Lord Alistair, we must go! The noble averts his gaze from Father Decorous and flees with the rest of the group as several Vizians chase them. They push their way into the forest and through the dense fog of trees they lost their pursuers, but only half of the original caravan remains alive and present. Alistair grips his bloodied sword tightly and looks back towards the village. We left Father Decorous. I have to go back. Cheryl holds up her sword, blocking the noble. You cannot. It is my task to protect you. We cannot abandon Father Decorous. Then it will come with you. She turns to one of the guards. You can still fight, can you not? The guard nods, and the exorcist turns back to the noble, waiting for his approval. Fine. Alistair dashes out of the trees with Cheryl. In truth, the noble's chest is pounding like a drum, and he's glad to have the exorcist behind him. He fathoms what could happen if she had not been there. Regardless, he continues sneaking through the town that is crawling with Vizians and soldiers, searching most likely for them and additional survivors. 
A good deal of them are rag ravaging the wagons and looting the supplies for themselves. Elster looks at them with disgust and contempt, but he proceeds onward, moving quietly across corners of houses and keeping away from the sights of the patrols. As he was about to step out of the corner, Cheryl holds the noble back, gesturing towards two visions passing by, easing her grip and allowing him to cross. Father Decorous' voice escapes from the abandoned cathedral at the town square, and the two cautiously make their approach until they reach one of the many windows of the building. They carefully raise their head and peer through the window, evaluating the scene before, thin before entering. The old priest lies bounded to a chair at the center of the church. The aisles of seats have been destroyed, and the statue of the goddess lies on the floor in pieces. The altar had been desecrated with the corpse of the villagers, all bloodied and lying in horrified poses with organs torn out and limbs spilt from their bodies. The noble presses his hand over his mouth, suppressing the urge to retch, and Cheryl remains ever so composed. Three Visians surround the old priest and the eldest of them, a tall Visian even by their standards, in bulky black metallic armor, long threads of brownish hair, and a scar over his right eye forces the father to gaze at him. I ask you again, priest. Where is the silver star? I told you once before, I don't know anything about a silver star. The Visian strikes the priest, knocking a tooth out of his mouth, and sends it flying across the floor. Liar! He turns the chair toward the altar and pulls out one of the priest's hair, forcing him to look. Look upon your people, priest. Know that they squealed like pigs as we got them before your precious goddess. The goddess will pay you back one thousandfold, Visian. So pray, priest. Pray for your goddess to bring us judgment. In the end, your goddess means nothing to us. Now I ask again, where is the silver star? I don't know what you're talking about. A Vizian yells from the outside, pointing his crossbow at Alistair and Cheryl. Found them! The elder Vizian turns and sees the two at the window, sneering and begins barking orders. Take the priest! The other two Vizians grab Father Decorous and drag him away as the elder approaches them. Another dagger appears on Cheryl's hand and lodges itself inside the Vizian's throat as he alerts the others, but they've already begun converging on them alongside the elder Vizian. Alistair turns to the exorcist with a sword in hand. Cheryl, keep them distracted. I'll go for the father. My lord, we do not have time to argue. We have to rescue him. The elder Vizian bursts through the window and sweeps his mana blade at the two. Alistair rolls away as Cheryl splits the blade with her sword. The elder Vizian looks at the exorcist with a surprised face before kicking her away to prevent a counterattack. While the elder focuses his attention on Cheryl, Alistair crawls through the church and pursues the two that had left the priest. With the priest, the elder tosses the hilt aside, and a bla bla blade of black iron protrudes out of his gauntlet. Magic is too unsightly, anyway. The clash of the katana and the elder's arm blade echoes as Alistair steps through the church and down the path to the other side of the town. The two visions drag the priest across the dirt road, repeating the question asked by the elder, but Father Decorous remains defiant. They toss the priest onto the dirt, and one of them kneels, aiming the mana blade at his throat. Alistair takes a step forward, and his hand tightens on the handle of his blade as but as he approaches them. His fingers relax. A thought wanders into his mind, and he freezes before the church, watching the events unfold. The Vizian asks the same question again. Just kill me already. Even if I know what it is you seek, I'll, I would never tell you. The Vizian strikes Father Decorous on the face, and he bites the Vizian's arm. The soldier screams and kicks the priest's face into the dirt, and the father attempts to flee, but the second Vizian grabs him and pulls him back. Father Decorous pulls a dagger out of his belt and drives it into the second guard, but the first recovers from the bite, piercing the mana blade into the priest's neck. His blood pours out through the gaping wound and escapes his lip as his eyes roll to the sky. With a forceful pull, the blade leaves the father to his neck, and Alistair looks calmly at the old priest's body as it collapses onto its side. Once the father is dead, the noble quietly approaches the remaining Vizian, plunging a sword through its chest. The last Vizian gurgles from the blood in his mouth before falling over, and Alistair kneels over the priest, feeling nothing but emptiness inside as he closes the elder priest's eyelids. The young noble lifts the bloodied body in his arm, and the priest's blood soaks through his clothes, penetrating to his skin. He stares at Father Decorous, devoid of any feelings or thoughts, before he turns to the church. Cheryl! He yells loudly. Then a few moments later, she bursts out of the window and lands, rolling across the dirt. The elder Vizian smashes through another window and lands across the exorcist. We are leaving, Alistair yells, and rushes back into the woods with Cheryl in behind. The elder Vizian points to them as the other soldiers either rush out of the church or move around it. Get after them, he ordered. After a trek ar across the forest in circles, misdirection... 
the two of them lost again and return to where the others await them. As Alistair gently lays Father Decorous's body on the grass, some weep while others pray. The Visians killed him before I could get to him. I was too late, I'm sorry. The noble sheaths his bloodied sword, lamenting over the still corpse. What should we do now, my lord? Cheryl asks. We keep going. We need to get to Dallas Tai now more than ever and warm them. Alistair looks at the priest's body. We have to bring Father Decorous's body back home. He died, murdered in cold blood by those damned Visians. He tightens his fists as tears slip out. The council, the Grand Masters, all of Idris must know. His sacrifice must not be in vain. Cheryl, you need to return to Idris. My lord, I am tasked with protecting me is no longer a priority when Idris is in danger. Do you disagree? Cheryl shakes her head. I do not, my lord. You have the best chance of returning to Idris safely. You have to go back and warn them. The exorcist considers her choices carefully before she nods. But what of you, my lord? Who will protect you? The men who can still fight will continue and escort me to the capital. Alistair turns to the remaining guards, who nod in approval, then returns to the exorcist. Will you go, Cheryl? She gives Alistair a stiff nod. Go quickly, and lay him to rest. She nods again and lifts Father Decorous's body as she urges the other priests to move. She gazes back to Alistair one more time before taking off with the rest. Everyone... We need to get to the capital as quickly as possible. The queen and her court must be warned. The remaining soldiers got up and follow Alistair as he continues his journey to Dallas tie. But as he turns his back to the rest, his lips and, brown, uh, and brows dip into a pained expression. <laughs>